know, when you have to build for a larger community, when you have to build for a country, you need to be able to deliver. You need to be able to deliver at scale. You need to deliver consistently. It is of a scale which India has never seen before. It has so many technologies that have never been handled before by an architect here. It sort of gets your imagination going, right? You want to get your energy into that. Highlight the session of today, a very interesting design dialogue between the renowned Dikshu Sikhupreja and Akshay Look, Dikshu, when I, you know, we've obviously crossed paths many times, but the first time I saw you speak publicly was around 2013, 2014. Right? And, uh, it was a session where people were presenting a lot of their architectural work and you know a lot of them are in the room today and you sort of came out with a few sketches and uh, photographs of you know slum developments and such and said you know we're all creating and focusing on islands of excellence but have we forgotten about cities and what i see you do is actually focus on that Right. So what I th and I think the focus of your conversation was really just, uh, you know, yeah. the focus of your of your talk that day was just, you know, a generic overview of what was happening. But soon after that, you know, you realize that, you know, when you have to build for a larger community, when you have to build for a country, you need to be able to deliver. You need to be able to deliver at scale. You need to deliver consistently. You need to work in rational time frames, and you need to be able to lead a mechanism, you know, which is say a government or a large organization uh, that will navigate all kinds of, uh, you know, all kinds of things that we're generally not trained to do as an architect. Now that you've done so much work at this scale, I'm curious to understand how you do this from the perspective of a practice, from the perspective of running a practice in the business of practice. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> good evening everyone. And um, I hope the conversation that we are going to have over the next few minutes is uh, something that gets you thinking about something that's very close to my heart. And that's why I think the conversation that you remember or, or the presentation that I made a decade ago, uh, my thought process still remains the same. And that is that as being trained as architects and urbanists, it's very important that we don't lose the path that while our medium of interacting with society is projects, but I think there is a deeper and stronger purpose behind what we do. And that is about how we can improve our built environment not just the project we are assigned to do. So I think maybe the uh, presentation that Akshat is talking about, I felt it's not important, although it's very tempting as an architect that we, you know, when you produce a piece of work, you want to share it with the world. You want to keep talking about it. But I think I felt at that point, and I still believe in that, that it's very important to step back and think about the larger context, about what your work can do to society for the better. And therefore, it's very, very important that we are able to bring those issues into somehow the end result that we produce in the project. So when you talk about these large scale projects that we are involved in, yes, we are fortunate as a firm that we've been able to uh, design the tallest building in, in India, the largest building in India, longest building in India, etc, etc, etc. But I don't think that is the important point. The important point for me is that the scale of these projects, although even smaller projects, I believe, uh, can make a profound difference in, in what you are doing to the context around, and some of your works do that. But these larger projects, obviously because of the sheer scale and the number of people they impact, the users, the surrounding uh, context of it, I think it makes a huge difference. So that's where I personally feel that when we design such projects, we are able to keep a balance between somewhere celebrating our own, uh, con uh, our own culture, our own history, our own uh, local aspects of where that project is uh, being grounded with 
not just getting over romanticized with the past, but also embracing technology. So when you talk about Yashobhumi, yeah, Yashobhumi project, uh, which is the big international convention center and exhibition center in Dwarka, it is of a scale which India has never seen before. It has so many technologies that have never been uh, handled before by an architect here. So for us, from those viewpoints, it was very challenging. But I felt it was very important that the project still has to be grounded in, in, through India, with India, and has to have those elements in it that celebrate the Indianness of the project. So whether it is the design elements, whether it is how public spaces were handled in past, for example, step wells, that's one element we decided to really embrace in this project. And yet it has technology where it's the world's largest LED facade. Then it is also uh, very unique that it has uh, uh, one large hall, which is again the largest um, uh, convention center hall ever done in India, which has uh, total 11,000 seats, but just one hall has 7,000 seats. And most importantly, just at the press of a button, half of those seats can disappear into the ground and you end up having a flat hall, which you can use for multiple spaces. So I can go on and talking about it, but I think what I'm trying to say here is that these kind of projects can have a huge impact on society. And that's what I always believe should be seen rather than just form making. Um, yeah, and I think, um, I think what I'm trying to veer towards is that usually these projects come through a murmur, right? Through the roots of whatever's going on. I think you guys have, as a practice, you guys really have your ears to the ground to see what's really going on in the mechanisms of, you know, the, the walls of every single state government as well as the central government to actually reach out for these projects. For example, in our case, I mean, we worked on um, the Central Vista before it became the Central Vista, which was a kind of series of murmurs of projects or murmurs of a talk. Um, and the moment you hear that and you, you hear even at the scale of our practice that hey, something like this is going to happen, it sort of gets your imagination going, right? You want to get your energy into that and you start investing your time, you know, your, your resources into putting a, you know, a theoretical framework for it. We got the murmur of a brief about a year before all of it happened and we started looking at, you know, how could this project be an exemplification of, you know, a city in India for the future, right? It is arguably one of the most important projects that have happened in the last hundred years for the presentation of this country. Um, so we did a project where we, you know, we, we, you always get a murmur of a brief. You have to sort of develop it yourself. You're ne it's fairly loose ended. It's usually an RFP format of some sort. Um, and there's many things that you have to put out there, right? So, for example, in our case, we looked at energy systems, densification systems. How would you present, you know, a, you know, a city for a populace like ours 100 years hence? Uh, we looked at cyclic economies, you know, shared ownership, um, transport systems. And by the time we were done with our studies and we started talking to industry at large, industrialists and sort of restart to every possible large name in India to say, how do you support this project in X, Y, Z manner? How do you see mobility in a place like this a hundred years from now, not just in the immediate future? We sort of found ourselves up, up against a wall to say, hey, almost nothing is possible that we talk that we would sort of envisage. And generally, I find that nowadays, Industry is more closed than bureaucracy. You know, it's a sort of turnaround thing. I saw within the year that the project actually happened that the government worked at a pace that you cannot imagine industry working at to make, to turn things around, things that have happened here. Did you find something similar when you did your proposal? Did you, you know, what were, what were the learnings that you felt through yours, which was, you know, an incredible scheme done in, incredibly quick time and you know like ours was kind of not realized yeah 
Well, that's the perils of uh, an architect. You can dream a lot, but only that gets built what has to be got built. So, uh, but in the case of Central Vista, I think uh, for us, uh, what was very important was that for a project like that, one had to see the broader and larger context of it. it uh, very similar to what I was speaking about earlier, that, you know, it was not just the Central Vista uh, physically, that stretch of it, but how do you look at this as an opportunity, for example, you know, connecting the ridge to the river uh, and how that whole experience is. Because on the one side is the ridge, which is an, uh, uh, an element of nature. It's uh, the largest city forest in the world. So how do you connect that and connect it to a river, which has been the, actually the basis of why Delhi got uh, uh, sort of established in the first place. So how do you connect these two elements of nature and then by default, the built environment starts coming around it. And similarly, the other aspect was how do you celebrate democracy? So when you have the central, what is today called the Kartave path, uh, paths, and you have the greens around it, one is just to have manicured lawns, which are not quite uh, in sync with our kind of climate or sustainable design, etc. So uh, instead of that, how can you create levels and spaces where people can sit or this image right now before you how do you create, you know, a sort of a public space where the play of shade and shadow and the vibrancy of a city, an old city and a chalk and the nooker and the gully that, it, that we have all been romanticizing. How do you bring that element into public space design? All these aspects became very important for us in the approach of creating this kind of a modern living monument which had to come up there. I also think to be able to do this, you have to prime yourself as a practice well before, right? So you've probably been doing this for a decade or so before prepping yourself to be able to present a project like this in the time frame that you do have to present it. Uh, it's whether you can imagine it or not, it takes a certain kind of firm to be able to even sit there and say, yes, we can deliver it and we can work through whatever curveballs are thrown at us, as you know, in a bureaucratic framework, a lot of curveballs are thrown at you, right? And they are, you probably never be, you know, ready for them. There's, there is the, the kind of prep and the kind of financial gumption you need. Is there a learning in that for, because that's something that we never taught in architecture school, right? Um, and that's something that I face or have faced in the past in my practice that, you know, do you, do you do this? Is it fair to be? Is it fair to put your money where your mouth is before you actually even are asked to dream up of a proposal? So I think in in the case of Central Vista, of course, for us also, it uh, literally came out of the blue, and we had that very very limited time in which we did all what we did. So uh, that was, of course, a tremendous and stupendous effort that the team in the office uh, put in. But what is very important, I think, for any architectural practice or the young architect sitting here, I feel that, you know, it's very important for us to first be confident of our own abilities, our abilities to deliver, the scale of work, the building typology, our design approach. And once we are confident about our own practice, our own firm's ability, I think that's what we should then uh, try to aim for. Uh, it's always tempting to look at a plate larger than what we can hold, but I think that has its own challenges and potential flaws. So it's very important that we slowly build our practice and our abilities to move towards larger scale of work, if that's what the intention is. And I don't believe myself, we might be working in a certain scale of practice, but I don't believe that that's the only way to do it. I think every intervention that we make uh, on the planet, every built uh, intervention that we do has its uh, uh, implications and therefore, it's very important that every project, no matter the scale, no matter the building type, it has to be looked at very sensitively. And once we do that, I think the doors open to more and more work. I have always believed that in architecture, in our education, we are given such a wide exposure. You know, sometimes you have to initiate projects yourself. And I think that's, that's a, a, I sort of learned that from a generation of architects that doesn't exist anymore. When you live, you need to constantly reinvent and constantly expand your horizon. By creating a whole new language of signage and sort of wayfinding.
for that place by using smaller design elements in a place that otherwise would desecrate it. 